Bismillah, hamidan wa musallin wa ba'd. Continuing in understanding uh, the nature of fatwa, particularly in our modern times, how is a legal ruling um, derived and how is it applied? Is it just simply, well, there's an ayah, there's a hadith. If it was that simple, there would be no different schools of thought at any point in history. It would just be people telling you, this is the ayah that solves all of your problems. This is the hadith that solves all of your problems. There has always been an uh, interpretive legacy, derivation methodologies. So in knowing the people whom you're dealing with, Ibn Qayyim al jawziyyah in his book, when he talks about I'lam al muwaqqeen an Rabb al the informative treatise um, for those who would sign on behalf of God and His Messenger. Meaning, they would give a ruling saying, this is the ruling of Allah in Islam. This is the divine law. So half of that book is dedicated to understanding the people to whom you will apply this law to. What's their background, what's their situation as a collective, as a culture, as a society, and individually, the person who specifically you're going, what is their circumstances, what is their struggles, what is their strong points, what is their weak point. And then you will be able to apply the law. And that goes back to the, the famous ayah about how prophets were sent relative. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا بِلِسَانِ قَوْمِهِ لِيُبَيِّنَ لَهُمْ No messenger was sent except for that messenger was sent speaking to the people in their tongue. And our scholars from the earliest commentators said, why didn't he say, uh, uh, He could have said, in the language of his people. But he said, in their tongue. Because we know that in one language, there are different tongues. Because people have different cultural ways of expressing themselves. So tongue here is referring to the holistic cultural reality of those people, their mentality, their emotional state. I mean, People from New York are different from people in Charlotte, are different from people in California, are different from people in Louisiana. And this is the United States of America, right? And so this is very important to understand how to deal with people. So imparting wisdom is important specifically in our time, in our day and age. Throughout history, in the Muslim world, in a Islamic caliphate, a governance that is all Muslim, it was sufficient for people to hear a basic understanding or to just follow whatever the sheikh says, and he would feel no need or she would feel no need to question this. Sami'na wa ata'na, which is a beautiful Islamic position of submission. And a default setting for the believer is that if I know that this is the law, then I follow it. Now we live today in a very different time where worldwide, worldwide, there has been a mission for at least 30, 40 years on a very strong level to put doubt in everybody's mind that religion is just some old stories, that religion is just people trying to control you. They're just making up rules to control people. So your average person, maybe they're not thinking consciously with that, but sub subconsciously they have been brainwashed with this bias. So people need to know the justification for your loss. Otherwise, they will easily discard it. Yeah, this is a sheikh or the guy or the religious man says this. They don't know what they're talking about. I question them. They can't explain anything, right? So imparting wisdom is a key element of giving the proper uh, fatwa. So uh, there is no doubt that anything that is commanded to or praised in the Qur'an is a good thing. And there is no doubt that anything that is disliked or prohibited in the Qur'an and the Sunnah is a bad thing. But is it equally good or equally bad or equally relevant to every person. And that is simply not true because the scholars have historically come up with different understandings. Allah did this. He said, They're asking you about menstruation. Allah explained why there are rules about it. It could be harmful to her or you that you are um, engaging intercourse with your wife in, in menstruation. Actually, that has become proven true. If you're having this and that blood is there, it could be that because of whatever pain she's feeling in there, that gives her pain. And it could be that you're getting some sort of disease because that blood is supposed to be washed out. It's not clean. Right? It's the body, the biology is saying get rid of it. Just like we get rid of other things. It is now excrement. You see what I'm saying? 
So Allah said, here's the reason why. Not because she's impure as a person, but because this particular thing here could cause harm. So we have in a salah, inna salata tanha anil fahsha'i wal munkar. Why should we be praying five times a day? It's beyond me how many people I get in trouble for doing this, but we just have to be a little bit more serious about how we're dealing with life here, particularly living in America. Some parent comes to me and says, my child is asking me why we have to pray five times a day. They say they know many good people who don't pray five times a day. And they've met bad people who pray five times a day. This is the logic, right? The question is, what is salah? If you don't know what is salah, and you're not praying it sincerely, and it has no meaning to you because you have, you're praying in a language you don't understand or have not taken the effort to learn it, then of course it's not going to have the effect. But the reason is, if you're praying it for the right reason, tanha anil fahsha'i wa munkar. If you know you're going to pray every couple hours throughout the day, and you know you just prayed, falling into sin is much harder. You know, if you're going to fornicate or use drugs and alcohol or cheat somebody out of a business deal, and you just got done praying salah, or you're about to go pray salah, you're going to start feeling guilty automatically. Like what I just did. Because you're going in there seeking His forgiveness, going in there seeking His guidance, going in there praising and thanking Him for His favors and blessings. As siyam why are we fasting? I said, why? She said, so, you know, we fast because that teaches us empathy. We learn what it's like to be a poor person. And then one person in the crowd asked the question, the American critical thinker, are you ready for it? Do poor Muslims have to fast? Ah, yes they do. Why? That is not the reason. That is a secondary benefit. The reason is لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ Spiritual discipline is the reason why everyone is fasting, Allah said. So giving you the wisdom is not some hard thing to come by. It's actually mentioned in the Qur'an and the Sunnah in multiple situations. And scholars always agreed that الْحُكُمْ لَهُ عِلَّةِ Every ruling has a justification behind it. وَالْحُكُمْ يَدُورُ مَعْلَتِهِ وُجُودًا وَعَدَمًا Okay, the ruling will go along with its justification, meaning this is where you get analogies. So if you look in another situation and the same reason why that's haram is why that is bad, then that is also haram even though it's not mentioned in the Qur'an and Sunnah. For all those uh, argila, hookah people in the hookah lounge talking about, oh yeah, it's not haram to smoke. What about all these prohibitions that it's wrong because it harms you? What about the Prophet specifically saying, don't harm yourself, right? <laughs> Well, now that's not, you needed, you needed somebody to tell you not to shoot heroin or it's okay. There's no ayah or hadith says don't shoot heroin, right? You see? So we have to gain this uh, understanding of the religion even as the person who's not a quote-unquote scholar. So the whole purpose for Islamic law is about bringing individual benefit and social welfare. And it is about averting individual harm or corruption and social harm and corruption. All scholars of Islamic law say there is no such thing as a ruling in which that is the ruling and it causes harm to somebody or it has no benefit whatsoever. There is no such thing as that, right? And so that's why I always challenge my high school group. I say, okay guys, you know, you guys are challenging everything seems haram. I'm here to tell you it's not haram. There are many things maybe you thought were haram, you know. But if you think something's unfairly haram, Please challenge, and I will explain to you why it's going to protect you from harm. And then they start to see, like that conversation afterwards when they start bringing this, is a whole different God ball game than the don't do that, haram, don't do that, haram. Why? Because in Islam we don't do that. But why in Islam? This is what the teaching, that's what it says somewhere in the Quran. Do you know? I don't know, but I, my people told me. We are not making a good case for ourselves here in this society that we live in. So may Allah bless us and give us, inshallah, tomorrow we'll start with the first fatwa, inshallah ta'ala, about how we will uh, solve some problems here um, in our uh, community, inshallah. Zakum Allah khair, subhanak Allah, bihamdik, ashadu an la 